Uh, my name is Davidad, or David Dalrymple. I'm a research scientist at Protocol Labs. Um, I'm one of the uh, in inventors, as Marta pointed out, on a couple of Protocol Labs' patents. Um, but uh, uh, more, more relevant as I've been thinking about mechanism design, and I did some of the crypto economics in Filecoin, and, uh, and I've also been thinking about sort of alternative structures for um, planning and uh, incentivizing research and development. Um, in a bunch of different ways, um, including certificates of impact and um, different kinds of uh, committee mechanisms for allocating um, prospective funding to research initiatives and uh, doing uh, quantitative causal modeling of the R&D roadmaps using technology trees. And then there's this stuff, which is about intellectual property management. Um, so the, um, the motivation for my thinking in, in this uh, zone is that uh, the way that patents try to incentivize innovation is with monopoly. And um, there's uh, some problems with monopoly. The obvious one is that it prevents uh, innovative competitors from <laughs> you know, sort of building on what you do without your permission. Um, another one is that there's um, big transaction costs um, uh, there, that was mentioned in one of the earlier talks that there were big transaction costs for making patents and litigating patents. There's also a big transaction cost for licensing patents, which is the thing that I'm, I'm uh, more, more directly concerned with. Um, and then finally, the monopoly pricing uh, mechanism is actually an imperfect way of capturing all of the value that you provide to society because you have to set one price level. You, you can't do price discrimination. So. Um, uh, so uh, there's this thing, uh, I guess, from Peter Thiel and, and some other VC type people who are like, yes, monopoly. If you don't have a monopoly, you don't have a business. Like, that's what you're trying to get. Um, but actually, like, the most successful tech startups don't use monopoly pricing. They use something more efficient, which is uh, Vickery Clark Groves auction. So Google and Facebook both. Like the way, the way their business model actually extracts value is uh, by running an incentive compatible auction to allocate advertising slots to um, relatively sophisticated customers who are you know, advertisers rather than consumers who of course pay nothing except their eyeballs. Um, <laughs> and um, so that, that's sort of, that's why I've got this book here is a, a game theory mechanism design. There's a whole chapter in here about sponsored search auctions. And that's actually, um, uh, more or less an applicable idea to intellectual property licensing. Um, and so the, the, the high level concept that I want to introduce is this um, notion that <clears throat> there's an analogy between um, creating a limited supply of advertising slots on a website and creating a limited supply of dollars of revenue that people are allowed to make using a certain patent pool. And then those slots, this, the, the, the slots for revenue can be allocated in an auction. Also kind of similar to a spectrum auction or other kinds of um, conti continuum auctions um, that are used in various fields. Um, so there are a bunch of different ways of implementing this. So I said Vickery Clark Groves, but Google actually uses a, a different mechanism called generalized second price, which technically is not Vickery Clark Groves. And they have reasons for doing that, mostly because they've done it historically and people, uh, their customers are used to it. Um, but th there's also the Meyerson optimal auction, which maybe provides more revenue to the, the holder of intellectual property. So the upshot of all that is there is not like one best mechanism. Um, that there are a bunch of different mechanisms to experiment with in terms of how to allocate the um, licensing revenue. So what I want to um, push forward is a platform uh, that enables a bunch of different kinds of experiment and experimentation with different mechanisms um, for managing intellectual property on a Web3 distributed ledger system. So there are four basic kinds of tokens or um, sort of uh, access control bits um, that um, that I, I, that I want to talk about there, and there might be, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm not completely sure that this is the right way to break it up, uh, but this is a, this is an initial proposal. So um, there's uh, the uh, kind of token that entitles you to a royalty stream, like the actual uh, uh, stream of income that is being extracted from society for this piece of intellectual property. 
Um, that token can be divisible, so you know, uh, inventors can, in some cases, can hang on to some fraction of it, or um, it can be traded as a kind of project token style thing where there's a market price that is, people are predicting what the future cash flows will be. Anyway, so that's one kind of token. It's like the, the passive income. Um, there's another kind of token which probably would not be uh, divisible in the same way, which represents the control over the economics, namely deciding when and how much of the revenue uh, to, to all allocate into the auction or into whatever kind of market is being used for that. So that, that token basically has the rights to mint a third kind of token, which is the license token, um, which entitles the holder to one dollar of revenue that derives from a certain um, IP portfolio. And then uh, there are you know, different ways that, that we could talk about implementing that. Like maybe you, ha you have those tokens, and then you, in a, in a transaction, redeem some set of tokens for an actual legal document that gives you the, the license with a revenue cap. Or maybe, as uh, the previous talk discussed, we could actually write up a license in such a way that it points at the chain and just says, you know, if you have the tokens, you have the license. You don't even need to produce a document. Um, but one aspect of this that I want to incorporate and, and then experiment with later is that those license tokens could be limited to a particular span of time. So like a start date and an end date. Um, could be you know, now until infinity as a degenerate case, but I think that's, a, that's an interesting piece of flexibility to build in there. And then the final token is a sort of, um, uh, I almost want to say political control, but more like uh, governance regulatory kind of control that the, the, the holder of that token gets to approve or deny whether people get to use the technology. And the degenerate case of that is that up front, the inventor burns that token, so it never gets used. But this is like a, another sort of piece of flexibility um, that we want to have because there are certain sorts of technologies like uh, strong AI technologies or brain computer interfaces that are dangerous. And we want to be able to use IP as a safety mechanism to say, OK, if you're going to use this invention, um, then you have to file an application to prove that you have the right kind of safety protocols. Um, and, and so they sort of create a private regulatory regime in that way. Um, so that would be a fourth kind of token, which I want to separate. Like in, in, in many cases, it's not appropriate for anyone to have that, that kind of control. That's sort of one, one of the main problems that I personally have the biggest issue with in the current patent system is that the economic rights to seek rent or, or get passive income um, from, from an invention are coupled to uh, having to, you know, being the person who you have to get permission from in order to, to do anything with it at all. Um, I think that's, um, that's about all I wanted to say. So yeah, thanks for your attention.